。美国财长耶伦访华，释放何种信号 ？The rhetoric between U.S. and China can get very tough, but I think underneath it all, there is a mutual respect and understanding. 美国债务危机暂解，新债海啸或将来到。We Most Americans were upset that it taken as long as it did to get to the final resolution of the issue. 风云对话专访纳斯达克副主席罗伯特·麦克易。据中国财政部网站消息，经中美双方商定，美财政部部长珍妮特·耶伦将于七月六日至九日访华。这是继今年六月中旬美国国务卿布林肯访华后，美国又一高官访华。访华前，耶伦频频就中美经贸合作释放积极信号。他在众议院金融机构委员会的听证会上发声，反对中美脱钩，称倘若美国彻底切断对华经济关系，将是一场灾难。罗伯特·麦克易，纳斯达克副主席，于二零零六年加入纳斯达克。负责领导拉丁美洲和亚太地区新上市公司的业务发展。六月二十八日，麦克易在天津参加了夏季达沃斯论坛。他表示，中美两大全球经济体应该互相配合，两国央行可以在国际上发挥更好的角色。Hello, Bob. It's great to have you on Talk of World Leaders.、Uh, welcome to Beijing. Thank you, Nancy. It's great to be here. U.S. Treasury Secretary、uh, Jenny Yellen, I think she's keen to visit China, and、uh, I think commentators say one of the reasons that she's coming is trying to persuade China to buy U.S. Treasury bonds. What's your view on that? My view is that it's a it's wonderful、uh, if she would come. I think it's really important for、mm -hmm. her to come and talk to her counterparts to show the、mm -hmm. leadership of this administration in terms of engaging. Directly with the Chinese Central Party, I don't know if she's here to, to sell treasuries,、mm. uh, but I'm sure a big part of it is、mm. going to be making sure that there are good lines of communication open between the two largest economies in the world. And how can China and the U.S. work together in this regard、well, to facilitate the global economy recover? First starts with dialogue.、Mm. Uh, Secretary Yellen coming and. Having a having dialogue with her counterparts and making sure that we continue to understand each other's perspective and philosophies、mm. on how we're going to engage on working with the emerging countries, emerging economies around the world. And I think the other is recognizing that if we don't do certain things,、mm. we Create destabilizing effects in economies in certain regions of the world because of what a run on the bank or a def another default or super high inflation will bring to a particular、uh, country, a particular region, and、uh, and I don't think that that's good for either of our economies. Though many of these ones just pale in size, the long tail effect. Is going to be important for us to mitigate as much as we possibly can. And how do you see this line of rhetoric of、uh, de-risking and competition? I mean, it used to be decoupling between the two major economies. We're both being respectful of each other.、Mm. We are not going to agree on most things,、mm. but where we can make those small strides of things that we do agree on. And use those as the foundation to continue to build. It will help us bring us together. The rhetoric is very tough. The political rhetoric in the U.S. is really tough. The rhetoric between U.S. and China can get very tough. But I think underneath it all, there is a mutual respect and understanding.、Mm -hmm. And I hope that we can get to that being the primary way that we work with each other. Rather than kind of the, the secondary way behind the closed doors that U.S. and China work together. 纳斯达克全称为美国全国证券交易商协会自动报价表，创立于1971年，是第一个实行电子化交易的股票交易所。相比传统的股票交易所，纳斯达克的交易方式更加高效快捷。
。发展至今，纳斯达克已是除美国纽约证券交易所之外第二大的证券交易所，也是全球最大的电子股票交易市场之一。纳斯达克交易所主要以科技公司为主，如苹果、微软、谷歌等知名科技公司都在纳斯达克上市。近年来，越来越多的中国企业也选择在纳斯达克上市，如百度、哔哩哔哩、爱奇艺、京东等。纳斯达克为中国企业提供了一个与世界接轨的平台。Now we've seen in the past. Ten years,、uh, a lot of Chinese companies, especially tech giants, have come to the U.S. to come to Nasdaq for listings. How do you see the companies, the, or the type of companies that have evolved from, you know, the previous、uh, Sina, Baidu, JD.com to the more recent、uh, Pinduoduo and、uh, Aichi, and some of the newer type of tech companies? How have they changed? It's always an evolution.、Um, mm. So、a lot of the products and services that exist today in China and the companies that go public didn't exist when Sina and Sohu went public, and that's what's great about entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurship is something that's not owned by Americans; it's owned by the globe. There are great entrepreneurs everywhere, and there's always somebody who's looking for the chance to build something great. Take. Something that already exists and and change it in a way that will help help individuals, will grow a business, and so I think that you know Pindodo and Aichi and some of the companies that have come more recently to Nasdaq are the next next evolution of businesses that、uh, are growing here in China, and I know so many of the companies that I visited when I was here in April. You know, certainly the next wave of companies to、uh, to come to the U.S. and they're building just tremendous businesses here in China. As Americans, we look at at, at China. It's a total addressable market that's four times the size of the U.S. Currently, the second largest economy in the world, but the total addressable market is just amazingly large. And when you combine that with hardworking, innovative group of people. You're going to build amazing businesses. Now we've seen the China concept stocks, the, the Golden Dragon、um, by Nasdaq,、uh, for Chinese stocks. That's fallen by about five percent over the last six months. Why do you think that is? I don't put a lot of of stock, <laughs>、uh, pardon the pun, in、mm. um, just one particular index because、mm. indices can be skewed by. Depending upon their weightings, and one or two stocks making a dramatic move. So、mm. I actually don't don't think that a five percent move in the stock, especially relative to the U.S. stock market,、right. um, should be seen as anything significant. What I do know is、mm. that、uh, one of the major news outlets,、mm-hmm. uh, just in, early in、mm. this in the second quarter,、mm-hmm. had. Given the statistic that more money had、uh, had flown into Chinese stocks、mm-hmm. than any other non-U.S. stock、mm-hmm. market in the world, you know, though I know that a lot of Chinese CEOs are unhappy、mm-hmm. about where their stock price is today, I think that that there also is a tremendous opportunity for U.S. investors、uh, to invest in this market and to to find some fantastic companies that maybe they're selling at. A, At, at a discount. We all are supposed to be focused on long-term investing, and and hopefully, just we'll realize that there's a tremendous opportunity here in China and and Chinese companies that are listed on Nasdaq. 中概股审计监管问题一直备受市场关注。二零二零年十二月，美国通过的外国公司问责法，滴滴二零二二年六月宣布从纽交所退市等一系列事件，使得中国企业赴美上市的势头陷入低潮。二零二二年八月，美国公众公司会计监督委员会 （PCOB） 与中国证监会和财政部签署审计监管合作协议。同年十二月 ，PCOB 发布报告，确认二零二二。年度可以对中国内地和香港会计师事务所完成检查和调查，撤销二零二一年对相关事务所作出的认定。中概股在美国的退市风险暂时解除。
how do you see with Chinese companies coming to list? I mean, there are a lot of Chinese tech companies that are listed on NASDAQ and New York Stock Exchange. What's the trend with Chinese companies coming to NASDAQ and other companies in the Asia Pacific region? The past two years have been very difficult um, since the listing of Didi in the, in the US uh, and the impact of that listing. Um, over and the overhang of the HFCAA and the PCAOB audit issue right. that uh, that that addressed. Since that has been uh, eliminated, de-risked um, as of the end of last year in terms of PCAOB doing their review. Um, yeah, giving, they've been able to do that. Yes, they? China was very forthcoming in mm. working with the, the regulators in the US, which was very positive, giving comfort to companies that if they came to the U.S., that they wouldn't potentially be delisted in a short period of time. So if, if you were a, a Chinese entrepreneur, Nancy, you, you wouldn't want to come to the U.S. Mm. during the past, certainly, two years and then uh, have a chance that you were going to be delisted in short order. Now that that doesn't exist anymore, I think there is a lot more interest by mm. those entrepreneurs in, in coming mm. to a uh, coming mm -hmm. to the U.S. for their listing. Mm. At the same time, the market now isn't there for them. So mm. just because everything was cleared by December 31st of 2022, 2023 hasn't been a welcoming IPO environment for any companies, let alone Chinese companies. Last year, we also saw some uh, Chinese state-owned companies that did get delisted from the U.S. stock market. I think there were several from the New York Stock Exchange. How do you look at their decisions to delist and what impact do you think it has? I believe there were five Chinese mm. companies. They were all listed. They were all SOE-backed companies right. and all listed on New York Stock Exchange and all listed on New York Stock Exchange, mm. I believe, in the early to mid-1990s. So they've been listed there for many, many years. I think those companies were more of the, the lightning rod for tensions between the U.S., especially SEC and CSRC, because of the state-owned uh, you know, aspect of those companies, mm. real or perceived, but mm. the state-owned aspect of it. Once they voluntarily and just remove themselves from the board, mm. uh, I think that coupled with the, the agreement by mm. PCAOB and, and Chinese regulators, CSRC, and then the clear audit at the end of the year has set up a true opportunity for Chinese companies to come back to the, the U.S. capital markets. That, so that was, I think that has set the foundation.硅谷银行因流动性不足和资不抵债宣布倒闭，这是美国历史上第二大银行倒闭事件，仅次于在2008年金融危机中倒闭的华盛顿互助银行。硅谷银行是一家州立商业银行，在全美排名第16，资产规
presents an opportunity for us to be introspective and to review policies procedures philosophy and to make sure that we can prevent it from from having an occurrence in the future sure and did nasdaq play any role in helping to mitigate the impact of the crisis well i won't run away from it silicon valley bank was one of our banks one of our larger banks listed on nasdaq 16th largest bank in the united states where we were proud to work with them for many many years they were a shining star of the banking system not only in the u.s but certainly a company which grew from its smallest days on nasdaq all the way through this year and really the place to go for tech companies and tech stuff absolutely the place to go if you needed if you needed money you needed advice uh you went to silicon valley bank that was people talk about their local bank but that was the local bank for silicon valley for the entire bay area the role that we played was the fact that during every opportunity that the markets were open and that investors in silicon valley bank wanted to buy or sell shares of silicon valley bank that our market was open it was deep it was liquid and that we provided the platform for them to make the investment in or sell their shares in the bank so that's that's our role as a platform we're not we're not going to choose the winners and the losers we're not going to make a determination about what an investor's investment dollars should go towards we're here to make sure that we are up all the time a hundred percent of the time to allow for investors to make investment decisions 六月三日，美国总统拜登签署了一项关于联邦政府债务上限和预算的法案，使其正式生效，暂时避免了美国政府陷入债务违约。该法案暂缓债务上限生效至二零二五年的年初，并对二零二四财年和二零二五财年的开支进行限制。这是自二战结束以来美国第一百零三次的调整债务上限。根据美国财政部最新公布的数据显示，美国国债首次超过三十二万亿美元，这比此前预测的提早了九年。美国联邦债务规模占其国内生产总值比例已超过了百分之一百二十，相当于每个美国人负债九点四万美元。The U.S. Congress has passed uh, an agreement to uplift. Um, the limit where you can continue to borrow, and I think uh, basically uh, that means suspending the debt ceiling until 2025, until after the presidential elections. How do you see this is going to impact the U.S. and the rest of the world? I think it de-risks uh, this whole uh, mm. situation. Um, mm. It did take too long. Um, it was recognized earlier this year that we needed to do something about raising the debt ceiling. I think we, most Americans, were upset that it had taken as long as it did to get to the final resolution of the issue. And it's become rather political, hasn't it? It is. Yeah. It is political. I mean, in the U.S., we have become very polarized. We have two very distinct mm. sides of every single argument. And it feels that every situation, whether even an economic situation, becomes political. Mm. And it's unfortunate that we're not coming together, especially on situations like a debt ceiling raise, which is in everybody's best interest, and not mm. using it for political purposes, mm. which it feels like it was done on both sides of the aisle mm. uh, during this entire process. But having it done. At least a few days before the U.S. could have gone into technical default mm. um, was really important. Uh, I think that if we had allowed it to go much farther, it could have been a very difficult situation for the global capital markets. Mm -hmm. And inflation has been an issue um, for the U.S. and for a lot of other countries as well. Yes, we've been fighting inflation. Uh, mm -hmm. If we, I guess, if we listened to Larry Summers two years ago, uh, we all could have been. Out in front of this, uh, he had he he was one of the lone voices who recognized the fact that all of the money that had been poured into the economy, all the stimulus, had a, a tail that was going to drive up inflation, and 
when you couple that with some of the challenges in terms of the you know, supply chain issues that we all experienced and uh, and then you layer on some of the geopolitical we had a you know kind of perfect storm that was driving up inflation certainly in the US but when the US interest rates went up it certainly was one that was going to drag the global interest rate environment up also on a separate issue rising interest rate we usually make the cost of capital more expensive and sometimes making IPOs less attractive. So with the Fed raising interest rate recently, how do you see the IPO market going? Has it impacted uh, the companies coming to list? It has been uh, a, a, a tough time in the IPO market uh, mm -hmm. over this, uh, this past year and a half. And mm -hmm. we're seeing pockets of green shoots. We're seeing some opportunity. Mm -hmm. We hope for this fall there was a recent analytical paper put out by Goldman Sachs indicating that they thought that the last third of the year, the post Labor Day to the end of the year uh, window for IPOs could be a very strong one. We hope, we hope that they're right. Uh, so we're, uh, we're excited about the prospects in the future. We know, the, we know how strong the pipeline is. Mm. Uh, I haven't seen one this strong uh, in many years. So there are many companies who have delayed their IPOs based upon the valuations and achieving the valuations they may have seen in the private markets. And so we're cautiously optimistic about the, that period later this year for the IPO market to have a resurgence. 麦克易此次访问中国，除了在天津参加夏季达沃斯论坛，他还到访北京及其他中国城市，拜访已在纳斯达克上市或者潜在的上市公司，并与风险投资人、私募基金代表、银行家和监管者会晤。麦克易表示，随着 IPO 市场复苏，筹备上市的中国企业有很多，中国企业前往纳斯达克上市的前景仍有巨大潜力。What kind of company do you think is most suited to list on NASDAQ? You said some companies are better to go to the local stock exchange, but others, NASDAQ might be a good choice. We're very strong in healthcare, and clearly China is focused on healthcare and biotech. We're the number one, by far, biotech market in the world, and, and also the number one overall healthcare mm. market in the world. Uh, so we certainly think that that is a, a strength in companies and that vertical should be considering NASDAQ. Mm -hmm. Technology, we're, we're famous for our technology companies. We know that some companies mm -hmm. today from China might have challenges in being listed overseas uh, if, if they're in certain aspects of mm -hmm. technology and the data that they, that they may house or touch. But Overall, enterprise technology companies, we do exceedingly well in terms of those companies wanting to become part of our, our market. It's not lost on anybody that the first $3 trillion company ever yesterday was Apple, and, uh, and that's listed on NASDAQ. It's been listed on NASDAQ since 1980. Mm -hmm. uh, NASDAQ's 52 years old. Our first company, one of our first companies to list was Intel. Uh, so we certainly think that uh, technology is a, is a big area for us. And the third, among many areas, is EV. Uh, right. China is the leader in, in EV. Yes. You have built some amazing EV car companies here. But it's not just about the companies that are built and building a car. There's so much that goes into the car. There's so much that now needs to uh, be on the infrastructure side of that car. And so we think uh, that that being such an emerging area and you know NASDAQ is known for growth and innovation and entrepreneurship and disruptive technologies and certainly EV is one of uh, those that we've seen over the past decade and we're excited to, to work with so many companies in that space. But I always want to make sure that you, your, your audience recognizes mm -hmm. is that we at NASDAQ are not here in China and we, we came here to set up the first we were the first exchange to have a rep office, 2007. We were the first, uh, first ones. But we're not here in Beijing, we're not here in China to convince every Chinese company to come to the US. That's not our role. There are a group of Chinese companies every single year. Sometimes it's two, sometimes it's 22, sometimes it's 42, who choose to list outside of the local market. 
and when they decide to list outside the local market, we firmly believe that nasdaq is the but best place for them to list. and so those are the companies that i'm that i'm talking to. i'm not searching out a company that belongs on star market or or third board in beijing or or shenzhen. they're going to go to those markets and we encourage that. we think most companies belong in their local markets. a small group of companies that are going to come outside of china and we focus every day on making sure we're the best platform liquidity, services, price uh, to have Chinese companies and companies from around the globe to, to mm -hmm. list on our market. What are the characteristics of Chinese entrepreneurs, would you say, and how has that changed? NASDAQ is the home for entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship. I mean, when people think about entrepreneurship, they think, they think of NASDAQ. They think of the amazing entrepreneurs that have built businesses, Steve, Steve Jobs and Larry Page and, and, and Sir, Sergey Breen, and, and, and then certainly uh, the person who's in, in the news as much as, uh, as anyone, uh, Elon mm. Musk. There are fantastic entrepreneurs that define NASDAQ as who we are. Take nothing away from Robin Lee and Colin who built Pindodor, or any of the great entrepreneurs that have built businesses here uh, in China. And so when I've seen, you, know, you ask how things have changed, but I don't think they've ever really changed. China is a place of super hardworking entrepreneurs. Chinese people are a tremendous, hardworking group of people and led by fantastic entrepreneurs who I think just dream big. Mm. They, you, know, you all value education here so much and you take that education and recognize the fact that uh, you can build something truly amazing Wonderful. Thank you very much uh, for being with us today and thank you for sharing all your insights. Thank you I so much. It was, it was a delight. Trip. Thank, thank you, you, Bob.